I'm Beverly Morgan Welch. I am the Executive Director of the Museum of Afro-American History in Boston and Nantucket, and I welcome you to this session. Um, I may have been given this session, The Memory of Slavery in New England, because it is one of the most frequent questions I am asked as the Executive Director of the Museum. I get calls all the time that reference the fact that there was no slavery in New England and um, that what slavery there might have been was so much better than it was in the South um, that I have had to um, take ang anger management courses <laughs> and, and <clears throat> in order to kindly uh, and, and comfortably address those issues and help pe people understand the power and the impact of slavery in New England. Um, the museum's African Meeting House here in Boston is undergoing restoration in preparation for the 200th anniversary, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2006, and it is one of the reasons that it is unavailable for this session and others, and I encourage you to come back, and there are occasions on which we will have hard hat tours. There's also a Black Heritage Trail tour for anyone who is um, uh, brave enough this afternoon. We'll have many umbrellas, I'm sure, uh, at 1 o'clock. Um, I, I also encourage you to go to Nantucket as well and to uh, participate in the museum. I want to um, take this opportunity to uh, introduce Assistant Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, John Wood Sweet. John's research focuses on the dynamics of colonialism and on the interplay of religious cultures. In Body's Politic, he explores the encounters of Indians, Africans, and Europeans in New England and argues that the racial legacy of colonialism shaped the emergence of the American North as well as the South. This year, he has been on leave at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University, how appropriate, and is here to present <laughs> his paper, The Lives of Venture Smith, Slavery and Politics, and the Politics of History. John. Well, thank you, Beverly, and thank you um, all for turning out on this um, pathetic morning. Um, when Venture Smith decided to tell his life story in 1798, he had quite a story to tell. Born the son of an African prince around 1730, uh, he was captured during a regional war when he was about eight years old, taken to the seacoast, and sold into slavery. He was purchased by one of the officers on a Rhode Island vessel who took him back to New England. And Venture spent about uh, 30 years enslaved in Connecticut and on Long Island, um, yeah, basically around Long Island Sound. During the 1760s, when he was in his mid-30s, he managed to save enough money to purchase his freedom. And after being swindled by several different masters, he finally became free. He then went into business for himself, um, purchased land first in Long Island and then later on in Connecticut and earned money through day labor by chopping wood, by fishing, and most interestingly as a small-scale coastal trader, um, carrying cargo short distances along um, Long Island Sound and up and down Connecticut riverways. Between the 1760s and the 1790s, he owned something like 17 different vessels. Throughout the region, he was known for his integrity, his industry, and his remarkable physical strength. In fact, if you go to visit the um, Stanton homestead in Stonington, where he lived for much of his life, um, the, the house is still there, the family is still there, um, and there's a huge stone that says the Venture Stone, uh, which he reportedly lifted and carried to put into a stone wall. And it says, the Venture Stone weight 413 pounds. Um, so he's legendary for his physical strength. When I first came across um, Venture Smith's narrative many years ago, I was puzzled by its timing. I assumed that the document had something to do with anti-slavery sentiment, but it was published in Hartford in 1798. And by that time, slavery uh, laws um, providing for the abolition of slavery 
in New England had already been passed um, over a decade, 15 years really earlier. Um, and almost all New England slaves were already free. So Smith's n narrative was clearly not um, an accident. It required a great deal of effort to publish. He was illiterate, so there had to be a, um, a person who wrote it out, an amanuensis. It was published, so there had to be, and this is a little facsimile, it's a tiny document. Um, it was published, so there had to be a printer who thought it was commercially viable. So if it wasn't designed to promote abolition of slavery in New England, why was it worth the trouble? Well, there were several relevant policy debates in the air. For one thing, slavery in New York and New Jersey uh, was still under debate, um, and slavery was not abolished there until 1799 and 1804, respectively, um, or laws providing for the abolition of slavery there. There's also the question of um, abolition in the Chesapeake. There was another debate over the international slave trade. Um, debates in the British Parliament had provoked widespread attention in the early 1790s. Um, and continued um, as a matter of federal politics in the nation's capital. However, I think that when Smith was thinking about his life story, he really had a much more local audience in mind. I'm inclined to think that for Smith, his main concern was the status of New England's free blacks. And for him, this had a lot to do with how the history of slavery, or whether the history of slavery was remembered, um, and how its legacy was understood. The history of slavery had already become controversial in the late 18th century when it became central to two basic questions. First, should slavery be abolished in the areas where it hadn't been abolished already? And second, could free black um, people be incorporated into the American Republic as equal citizens? I want, what I want to do today is to emphasize that Venture Smith's narrative was one voice in a developing public debate. His narrative was, in fact, part of an extended political discussion in which history played an important ideological role. To set the stage, I want to begin by sketching out what seems to me some of the basic tendencies in early 19th century histories of slavery by focusing on one example, Alexis de Tocqueville's analysis of slavery and free blacks in his Democracy in America, which was published first um, between 1835 and 1840, uh, right at the same time Venture Smith's narrative was republished. In many ways, um, Tocqueville's analysis culminates um, the dominant narrative that had been developing since the 1780s. Tocqueville makes um, a number of relevant arguments. One of them, and this is a point in which he agreed when he visited with um, John Quincy Adams in 1830 in Washington, it, they both agreed that New England was not only the best part of the United States, but in fact the region that represented the nation's uh, ultimate destiny. For him, New England, for Tocqueville, New England had been set off by its historical point of origin. He, as Tocqueville tells the story, New England settlers had been dedicated not to material gain, but rather to the triumph of an idea. Coming from well-to-do classes in England, they migrated as families and devoted themselves to civil order, religious liberty, and social equality. New England was quickly distinguished by an almost complete equality of conditions. And over time, the region came more and more to present the novel, novel phenomenon of a society homogenous in all of its parts. Obviously, this vision of New England's history ignores or requires erasing a number of things, including poverty, um, and also for our purposes, also the presence of native peoples, um, not only at the beginning of New England's history, but continuing through New England's history. And it also requires um, forgetting about New England's um, history of slavery and the continuing presence of free black people um, in New England. In fact, one of the things that's interesting is that Tocqueville was aware that unlike European nations, uh, which were, quote, peopled by shoots from the same stock, America was populated by what he called three naturally distinct, one might also say hostile, races. And Tocqueville felt that the conquest of native lands and the continuing removal of Indian peoples like the Cherokees was unfortunate. He felt that the um, continued enslavement of Africans in the southern um, states was unfortunate, but he felt that there was no real um, alternative. And this is because of his understanding of the history of slavery. And it's important to remember that for Tocqueville, 
In this conference, it's probably the only place that there might be some confusion. But for Tocqueville, the history of slavery is a southern history. As Tocqueville saw it, the history of slavery was an account of how Africans in America had seen their culture and their future potential destroyed. He writes, the United States Negro has lost even the memory of his homeland. He no longer understands the language his father spoke. He has abjured their religion and forgotten their mores. In addition, slavery destroyed the patriarchal African family. The Negro has no family. For him, a woman is no more than a passing companion of his pleasures. And from their birth, his sons are his equals. <laughs> so for that, was a bad thing for Tocqueville. Degraded to this extent, um, Tocqueville believed blacks would find freedom not a blessing, but a curse. All Tocqueville could offer the Negro was pity. Ceasing to belong to Africa, he has acquired no right to the blessings of Europe. He is left in suspense between two societies and isolated between two peoples, sold by one and repudiated by the other. In the whole world, there is nothing but his master's hearth to provide him with some semblance of a homeland. For Tocqueville, this was sad, even tragic, but not a matter of great moment, because for him, his central concern was American democracy, and he considered blacks and Indians both tangential to, that's his word, tangential to American democracy. Blacks and Indians, he said, were American, but not democratic. Now, for most of my time today, I want to discuss um, the main arguments that Smith was making in the narrative he published in 1798 to show that he was responding to and anticipating some of the kinds of arguments that Tocqueville and others um, had already started to make and would continue to make. And I wanted to close by taking a quick look at a number of other black writers who particularly after um, 1815 and the 1820s began to ever more forcefully and explicitly develop their own narratives of the history of slavery and racism in America. Like Smith, they emphasized that slavery did not make blacks unprepared for citizenship. They emphasized that all whites benefited and continued to benefit from slavery and other forms of colonial oppression. And they argued that the true legacy of slavery in America was not black debility, but rather the continuing force of white supremacy. When originally published, Smith's narrative, <laughs> this is carried with it a certificate signed by a number of prominent local gentlemen attesting to his good character um, and preventing their own version of his story, which they acknowledged begin, begins in Africa. They certified, quote, that said venture hath sustained the character of a faithful servant and that of a temperate, honest, and industrious man. And being ever intent of obtaining his freedom, he was indulged by his masters after the old ordinary day labor of his days to improve his nights in fishing and other employments to his own emolument, in which time he procured so much money as to purchase his freedom from his late master, Colonel Smith. Smith himself would hardly have disagreed with this account. He um, depicted himself in his narrative as a faithful servant. Um, he was, in fact, determined to procure his freedom. And he took great pride in the fact that he was a temperate, honest, and industrious man but he would not have agreed that his masters had been indulgent. And indeed, one of the interesting things about this little mini account of slavery in New England is the way it glosses over slavery and servitude. Instead, it focuses on the moment of his emancipation. And when we say that New Englanders tend to forget the history of slavery, they tend to forget the slavery part and remember just the emancipation part. Um, the result is that it turns in the history of slavery in New England into a rather tidy, self-gradulatory narrative um, and slavery becomes a story about white benevolence. At the same time, the praise of Smith appears to be a kind of backhanded criticism of those newly freed black New Englanders whom the popular press was representing as lazy, as thievish, and as disorderly threats to the good um, order of local cities. And part of this argument is that black people were running away from these abandoning honest work in the countryside and congregating in cities like Boston, where they were doing disreputable things like founding Baptist churches. Smith's own narrative was organized rather differently. He emphasized his childhood in Africa, the ordeal of his enslavement, his time while enslaved, his difficulties securing freedom, and the challenges he continued to face after becoming free. 
In contrast to the worthy gentleman who attested to his good character, Smith wanted to present slavery as a part of New England's history that should not be forgotten because it continued to influence the present. Slavery had been a violent and a wrenching ordeal, but it had not degraded his character. What limited his prospects in the New Republic was not his lack of industry or ambition, but rather the racism that was slavery's real legacy. So Smith begins his narrative with his childhood in Africa. He reports that he was born around 1729 in Donkandara, um, in the savannas of, of Guinea, um, that his father was a local um, um, uh, prince, uh, or tribe, uh, tr he calls it prince of the local tribe. Um, during his childhood, his parents were at one point um, separated. His father took multiple wives, and at one point there was a conflict, so he moved away and worked as a shepherd for um, a wealthy landowner. Then his parents were re reunited, and he came back to live with them. And shortly after this um, period when his parents were reunited, uh, the region was overrun by uh, a neighboring people who had been incited by, quote, some white nation um, to, to capture slaves. Smith watched from a hiding place in, in the reeds uh, as his father was killed, and then he himself was captured, um, put into a, um, into a coffle, um, and marched to the seacoast. Um, and this may be, I think, I'm told um, that this may be one of the only accounts in any um, early African narrative of the Kafal experience. In any case, he ends up on the, um, the Guinea coast of Africa, uh, where he is sold to a Rhode Island um, slaver um, named Robertson M Mumford. Um, and it's Mumford who renames him Venture, because Mumford purchases him as a private business venture, um, not as part of the, the ship's cargo. And after traumatic Middle Passage, Smith arrives in New England. Venture devoted about a quarter of his narrative to his childhood in Africa. Um, doing so allowed him to do several things. First, he showed that Africa was not an inherently barbarous region, as um, other writers were beginning to um, suggest. But rather, he argued that it was inhabited by a reasonably prosperous pastoral and farming peoples with complex political structures. Moreover, and interestingly, he acknowledged divisions and conflicts within African societies that created a more complex moral landscape. Europeans certainly fomented the wars that fed the slave trade, but African groups were also complicit. And he also created a dramatic narrative contrast, a happy period of freedom and independence before, before his ide ordeal, <laughs> ideal ordeal, ideal ordeal, his ordeal of captivity and enslavement. Venture was not born a slave. He did not suddenly become a slave. He was made a slave through a traumatic series of events um, at the hands first of hostile neighboring peoples, then of Anglo-American slave traders, and finally of New England settlers. If Smith's narratives began by setting up this dramatic narrative break, much of the rest of his story is an account of continuity. And the two themes he emphasized the most were on the one hand his own honesty, temperance, and industry, and white people's dishonesty, violence, and racism. Slavery, in his view, was not about benevolence. It was about violence and exploitation. He was not lazy. He was hardworking and virtuous. And he, in fact, contrary to Tocqueville's um, suggestion, he did succeed in holding his family together, despite many of the obstacles his masters placed in his way. Smith describes his early life in New England as a child, as relatively peaceful. But as he grew into um, manhood, he began to more actively resist enslavement. At one point, he attempted to run away and then came back, um, tried to patch things up with his master, but his master sold him, and that's how he ended up in the Stanton farm in Stonington, Connecticut. With the Stantons, things went all right for a while, but um, conflicts um, eventually developed. On one occasion, his wife was um, in the kitchen, <laughs> the kitchen's still there, um, fighting with his mistress. And Venture, in a very unusual move, interposed in this dispute. Mrs. Stanton um, was so angry that she raised a horsewhip against him, and he was so angry that he snatched the horsewhip and threw it into the fireplace. This was a serious breach of her authority, and he knew that he would pay. Retribution, in fact, came several days later when Mr. Stanton snuck up behind him with a club and whacked him on the head. 
Bencher, being a man of great physical strength, survived the blow, um, wheeled around, grabbed the club, and left his master screaming for help. Most of his fights end up with the other person crying to his mother or screaming for help. In this instance, um, in an extraordinary move, uh, Venture further escalated the conflict with his master by going, um, by seeking legal recourse. He left the household and marched over to, to a neighboring justice of the peace and lodged a complaint. The justice knew that it would be very difficult for him to intervene in the household viol domestic violence um, in um, Stanton's um, home. So he t tried to do his best not to intervene. He told Bencher, well, I'm really sorry about your situation, but what you should do is go back to your master and try and patch things up, and if this happens again, then come back. Well, at, right at that point, the master and the master's brother um, appear to bring him home, and the justice does take the opportunity to admonish them a little bit, and they, um, with their tails between their legs, kind of walk out and are on the road home, and just out of sight of the justice's house, they kind of start attacking him. Once again, Venture uh, prevails in this fight, uh, ends up with his master and the master's brother lying on their backs on the road, and him standing on their chests. So clearly, um, things in this relationship um, have become a little bit dysfunctional. Smith realizes that even when he wins, um, he loses. Um, he eventually had to submit to being handcuffed by the local blacksmith, uh, when he gets home, Mrs. Stanton is teasing him, so he teases her back by saying, thank you for my new golden rings. Um, and this infuriates her, um, and she has him padlocked, uh, his feet shackled with ox chains um, and padlocked. Now, this episode brings us to another set of limits, which are the limits, the limits masters faced as they were trying to negotiate with slaves. Obviously, a slave who's um, handcuffed and his feet are shackled um, isn't really going to be much help around the house. So they couldn't keep him um, tied up all the time. Um, they needed Stanton to establish his authority and get some, um, find a way of developing a more viable relationship with Smith. Fortunately for masters, one of their options when a relationship went bad was sale. They could cash out of the relationship. Um, Stanton begins by threatening to sell um, Venture to the West Indies, um, which was a terrible fate because most people died very, very quickly. Um, Smith says, go ahead. Um, so that bluff didn't work. And in the resulting negotiations, um, Smith worked um, to get the best deal he could by manipulating the transaction of sale. This is a topic that Walter Johnson has written about recently. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting moment where a slave has a certain amount of power on the margins to influence um, the results of a sale transaction. In this case, one of um, Stanton's neighbors kind of got the impression that things weren't going so well with Venture. Um, and so he said to Venture, wouldn't you like it if I bought you and you could come work on my farm? And Smith um, thought, well, sure, I'm open to negotiation. So this neighboring farmer said, asked, so he writes, this neighboring farmer, quote, asked me to make myself discontented and appear as unreconciled to my master as I could before he bargained uh, with me for him. Um, this is obviously an attempt to lower the price. And in return, this farmer would give me, quote, give me a good chance to gain my freedom. The sales soon went through. The new buyer got a good price. But instead of, of fulfilling his agreement and letting, um, giving Venture an opportunity to buy his freedom, instead, um, this local farmer um, attempts to sell him again to a man in New York. Venture flat out refused to go. Uh, the potential buyer um, threatened to force him, and um, he said, I'll tie you down to my sleigh if necessary. This must have been wintertime. Um, I replied that if he carried me in that matter, no person would purchase me, for it would be thought that he had a murderer for sale. The threat worked. The prospective buyer gave up. The local farmer um, that had bought um, Smith uh, returned him, basically <laughs> returned him to the Stantons, and the Stantons were, were forced to find a new purchaser. And this time, Smith found a better potential owner, um, Colonel Oliver um, Smith, uh, who lives a few miles away. Um, so Smith uh, remained living near his wife and children. 
And most importantly, uh, Smith off, uh, allowed, uh, ultimately allowed um, Venture a chance to purchase his freedom. Venture had made this kind of agreement with now with three different masters. His earlier masters had either stolen all of his savings so he couldn't um, purchase his freedom. They had simply reneged on the agreement. They had tried to sell him to someone else. And this was the first case uh, with Colonel Oliver Smith that Venture found a master who was willing to not only let him um, earn money and promised to um, purchase his freedom, but also actually ended up honoring the agreement. Partly this is because Smith got more legally savvy, and when he got savings, he put them in, um, in the hands of a local free black man. So there's a third party involved in these uh, financial transactions. Um, Smith did insist on a purchase price of 70 pounds, which Venture, who was not a man to be modest about his own worth, um, even he thought that was expensive, but he agreed to pay it. And around 1765, he became free. And one of his first acts was to, re, was to adopt the last name of Colonel Smith. Uh, so he becomes Venture Smith. Becoming a free man he set about earning enough money to support himself and to purchase his wife and children. And he did so with the, incre the same incredible strength, endurance, and self-abnegation that had allowed him to earn his freedom in the first place. He continued, in fact, in many of the same lines of work that he developed as a slave. Um, he, he did day labor, he chopped wood, um, he um, went fishing. Uh, eventually, or quick, very quickly, in fact, he bought his own farmland, the first in a long series of boats that he used to conduct small-scale trading ventures um, and cargo hauling enterprises around Long Island Sound. But as a free man, Smith continued to feel the hostility of local whites. And this continuity is something he really emphasizes narratively. While living on Long Island in the 1770s, the towns, as a free man, the town selectmen voted to expel, quote, all Negroes residing there. Smith ended up exempted from this uh, restriction um, because he was, had a, such a reputation for industry and had accumulated enough property. But even he took the hint and left that town and moved to um, a small town on the Connecticut River. There he purchased property um, and developed a reasonably prosperous life for himself and for his family. But he continued to face racial discrimination, which had serious practical consequences for him. And that's one thing you hear from these um, black writers is they're not interested in so much in the guilt of white people, which is often the debate over slavery these days that revolves around the guilt of Brown University. Uh, rather, they're interested in the practical consequences of racism. So one example was around 1790. He's an elderly man, uh, or aging man, um, tra <laughs> traveling um, to New London with one of his grandchildren, uh, like Haley, um, Smith took passage on a boat operated by an unnamed Indian man. On the return trip, the Indian took a cargo of two hogsheads of molasses uh, that were to be delivered to Captain Elijah Hart of Saybrook. When they arrived in Saybrook, they docked the boat at Hart's Wharf, and Smith was delegated to go off and find Captain Hart um, and report that the molasses had arrived and get payment from him. But during the time that Smith was off doing this business, the men unloading the molasses um, onto the wharf um, dropped one of the um, hogsheads overboard, and being molasses, it sank. So the value of one hogshead of molasses was lost. The result was that although Smith was not even present at the time of this accident, he was the one prosecuted uh, or sued by Captain Hart. Why was he prosecuted? He says, because the Indian man had no assets to recover. So the, uh, Captain Hart went after his assets. Smith was ordered to pay 10 pounds lawful money and the costs of court. He was outraged and consulted a number of local white um, gentlemen, but they told him to give up. They said his arbitrary was rich and determined and that he would be carried from court to court until the expenses of um, defending himself were greater than the damages um, he had been um, a judge, uh, a, um, sentenced to pay. So Smith paid up. But Captain Hart didn't even leave it there, um, but continued to taunt Smith for his weakness and misfortune. Smith writes 
an interesting passage, hey, evoking memories of his African homeland. Such a proceeding as this, committed on a defenseless stranger, almost worn out in this hard service of the world, without any foundation in reason or justice, whatever it may be called in a Christian land, would in my native country have been branded as a crime equal to highway robbery. But Captain Hart was a white gentleman, and I a poor African. And these words were italicized. Therefore, it was all right and good enough for the old black dog. The major themes that Smith articulated were, in fact, picked up and developed by a number of other black writers beginning um, in the early 19th century and especially in the 1820s. These black ministers, businessmen, and civic leaders presented the public with an account of America's colonial past that differed sharply from mainstream Anglo-American and, in this case, French narratives. They agreed that the discovery of America had opened up a new era in human history, but not, in their estimation, an auspicious one. As these leaders saw it, European colonialism had been a disaster that even the American Revolution had failed to redeem. Would to God that Columbus, with his exploring schemes, had perished in Europe ere he touched the American Isles, exclaimed New York minister William Hamilton in 1815. Then might Africa have been spared the terrible calamity she has suffered. After Columbus's fateful voyage, as Hamilton saw it, the immense treasures that inundated the mother country, the highly colored descriptions of its soil, climate, and resources spread such a universal desire of gain that it pervaded all ranks of society, from the peasant to the king. Like Tocqueville, these black leaders assumed that most early settlers in North America were motivated primarily by greed and characterized by ruthlessness. But unlike him, they argued that this greed and the resulting history of slavery and prejudice were central to the American story. Having destroyed the native peoples of America, the ruthless Europeans turned to the innocent and peaceful nations of Africa to supply laborers for their ever-expanding plantations. The results of slavery were the devastation of African nations, the suffering and death of those transported across the Atlantic, and the enrichment of the Atlantic colonies through the blood and sweat of slaves. And these black writers are at pains to remind people of the practical benefits derived by white people from slavery and colonialism, as well as the practical um, disadvantage they suffered as a result of racism. These basic dynamics of American history continued despite the American Revolution and could be seen in the expansion of Southern slavery in the 19th century, the conquest of Western um, Indians. And in fact, there's a uh, beautiful exhibit here on um, on Lewis and Clark exhibition um, in one of the other rooms, um, and in continued discrimination against free people of color in the North. Black leaders in the North followed Smith's lead in emphasizing the historical and contemporary effects of white prejudice. On the 4th of July, 1830, the Reverend Peter Williams of New York told his audience that the festivities of this day serve but to impress upon the minds of reflecting men of color a deeper sense of the cruelty, the injustice, and the oppression of which they have been victims. Slavery continued to be a national crime, and in the North, free blacks were deprived of their basic rights. Quote, freedom and equality have been put asunder. The rights of men are decided by the colors of their skins. The problem northern blacks faced lay not in themselves, but in white racists. What hinders our improving here, where schools and colleges abound, where the gospel is preached at every corner, and where all the arts and sciences are verging fast to perfection? Nothing. Nothing but prejudice. But what was the solution? Whereas Tocqueville tended to talk about racial prejudice, like slavery, as unfortunate but inevitable, these black writers insisted that prejudice born of ignorance could be overcome by the light of truth. What free black people needed to do was to comport themselves, like Venture Smith had done, in a way that would prove that white prejudices were unfounded. Prove to the world, wrote Bostonian Mariah Stewart, um, urging her readers, and there's this cute little poem she says, she says, though black your skin as shades of night, your hearts are pure, your souls are white. Similarly, in Providence, the Reverend Nathaniel Paul called for a moral regeneration of free black communities that would overcome white prejudice 
And these words are haunting in their resonance. He writes, We look forward with pleasure to that period when men will be respected according to their characters, not according to their complexion. That's 1827. Now, a number of black writers in this time began to develop more complicated theories of prejudice, theories that um, tried to explain prejudice not simply in terms of white ignorance. But interestingly, for my purposes, most black writers and Indian writers as well shied away from these interpretations. Most of these black and Indian critics like Tocqueville and other white political ideologues did not have much interest in pursuing the lines of inquiry about the connection between white supremacy and American democracy. They preferred instead to present an uplifting vision of American nationalism. As they framed it, the challenge was to realize America's revolutionary potential by opening citizenship to all of the nation's inhabitants. This was a vision based not on descent from a pantheon of founding fathers, but on the embodiment of shared values and ideals. The national narrative told by black and Indian writers of the early republic was more troubled than the story told by Tocqueville, but it was also, in the end, a story of redemption. Ultimately, they declared, America could be remade as a nation not of prejudices, bloodlines, and hierarchy, but of principles, virtues, and equality. Patrick Rail received his doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley and is currently and has been teaching at Bowdoin College um, as an associate professor with tenure in the Department of History. When I uh, sought to do a little research on, on Patrick, I never saw so many websites on how to approach American history reminded this morning that uh, in Florida they are accelerating graduation and American history and government are not required for graduation from high school. Um, I am hopeful to um, send them to your sites, Patrick. Uh, Patrick has written many articles, um, books, and done many conference papers. Uh, black protest and black identity in the antebellum north and he has edited with Richard Newman and Philip Lapans Lap Lapsans Lapsansky, <laughs> Pamphlets of Protest, an anthology of early African-American protest literature. Patrick Reel is presenting Instruments in the Hands of God, Black Activism and Black Agency in the Age of Emancipation. Patrick Reel. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you, folks, for coming out today. Uh, as sometimes happens when going from paper as proposed to paper as delivered, this paper has uh, changed shape uh, just a little bit. Um, I wanted to, take it, to make it about memory, but uh, my research kept pushing me toward the question of agency, as you'll see. Um, perhaps David, who has worked so exhaustively and so excellently on uh, the idea of memory will find this a welcome respite. <laughs> so this is going to be called instead um, Instruments in the Hands of God, Black Activism and Black Agency in the Age of Emancipation. In the half century from 1777 to 1827, the crucible of American nation-making forged free black life in the North. Through constitution, court, and law, the northern states of the new nation gradually, tentatively, and qualifiedly extended to people of African descent the fundamental human liberties that lay at the heart of the republic. What did the partial freedom of the American Revolution and its aftermath mean for black people in the north? How did they comprehend their own liberation? And what did their understandings portend for the struggle to liberate all black people from bondage? In her book, Disowning Slavery, Joanne Pope Mellish argues that New Englanders, and by extension, Northerners in general, largely wrote slavery out of their past shortly after the institution was abolished in the North. 
Even the abolitionist movement concerned itself primarily with the continued existence of Southern slavery rather than the legacy of slavery among free blacks in the North. Professor, Professor Mellish suggests that African Americans, uh, spokespersons, played an important role in this process in crafting a collective identity by erecting a noble African past for themselves, they sought to appeal to emerging values of ethnic nationalism. But, she argues, in the process, they elided a more recent past of slavery in New England, choosing, like white abolitionists, to concentrate on the consequences of Southern slavery for Northern free blacks in the form of prejudice. By writing Northern slavery out of the past, Mellish claims, Northern black spokespersons reinforced the notion that innate inferiority rather than historical circumstance had determined blacks' admittedly lowly state. One consequence of blacks' ahistoricization of their own struggle then was to reinforce the essentialization of race in early national America and thus accept the burden, to quote her, the burden of proof of their inherent unworthiness. Okay. I want to make very clear, I find Joanne's work excellent and fascinating, and, and it's been foundational for me. And when I started this research, I thought that what I was going to do, I hoped what I was going to do was prove her wrong, that there was this strong memory of slavery. And one of the reasons why this paper is less about the memory of slavery than I thought it would be is um, because Joanne's right. Um, I, th there is not a strong, the strong tradition that I was looking for. Um, but I do uh, have, have a couple quibbles with, with some of the other points that she makes, and particularly um, blacks' participation in the essentialization of ideas of race in the antebellum period, which I've explored in, in another venue. Um, and what I want to focus on today is the notion of black agency in this, and, and, and its relationship to the processes that she describes. Mellish illuminates an important instance of African-American historical forgetting, one that is perhaps of greater importance in African-Americans' many instances of historical remembering, which scholars have attended to so worthily in recent years. But today I want to argue against this bleak picture of blacks' role in the racial discourse of the early republic. While the black protest tradition forged during the age of northern emancipation tended to look toward a future of deliverance rather than to a past of degradation, it was through their future-looking gaze that African Americans sought to actively insert themselves into their own history by increasingly viewing black people as agents of their own liberation. The early decades of black public protest revealed that rather than writing themselves out of New England's past, black spokespersons drew upon America's sacred history to write themselves into their own and even national deliverance. As slavery withered in the northern states, African Americans forged thriving communities rooted in new social institutions, such as black churches, literary societies, and mutual aid organizations. From this matrix of community institutions emerged generations of black spokespersons who crafted a rich tradition of public protest aimed at liberating those still enslaved and elevating those nominally free. This body of protest thought drew upon a range of sources for inspiration and arguments, but one of the most profound of these was a tradition of prophetic thought that structured the experience of African-descended people in America into a historical narrative of past fall and future redemption. A close reading of sermons, public speeches, and essays suggests that black spokespersons shifted their presentation of agents of deliverance from white abolitionist patrons to African Americans themselves. This transformation in the agent of deliverance mirrored transformations in black political activism. As African Americans began to pose themselves as a distinct interest group with a need to act independently and concertedly in their own defense, and as black, a black leadership class with middle class urban origins emerged from free community institutions, they increasingly envisioned salvation deriving from their own hands. So let me kind of walk through some of the canonical texts of, of this period. And the first period I want to explore is the uh, period of uh, immediate uh, emancipation. The earliest generation of black leaders and writers in the North worked carefully to rein in African-Americans' aspirations for liberty, liberty, tempering their hopes for universal liberation with urgings that black people greet the prospect of emancipation with caution and patience. As New Yorker Joseph Sidney put it in the first decade of the 19th century, quote, the immediate emancipation of all our brethren in the United States is an event which we cannot reasonably expect and perhaps ought not to desire. 
Jupiter Hammond, the elderly educated slave of the Lloyd family of Long Island, New York, cautioned his fellow bondspersons to think very little of their status in this world. If God designs to set us free, Hammond intoned in 1787, he will do it in his own time and way. Far better, Hammond argued, for enslaved African Americans to consider the next eternal life and use their time on earth to work toward their spiritual salvation. Liberty in this world, he said, was nothing nothing to our having the liberty of the children of God. Even the most ardent black defenses of freedom balanced their calls for universal liberty with urgings, which were surely in part intended to mollify white's fears, for enslaved blacks to pursue a merely spiritual freedom. To those fortunate enough to enjoy freedom already, prominent African Americans lectured on the need for great care and personal conduct. This picks up on the point that John was making. They sought to counter what they believed were freed people's racially destructive tendencies towards licentiousness, and they thus established principles of an ideology of moral uplift and self-elevation that served as the cornerstone of the black freedom struggle for decades. Hammond posed a critical connection between the conduct of the free and the fate of the enslaved, quoting here, if you are idle and take to bad courses, you will hurt those of your brethren who are slaves and do all in your power to prevent their being free, unquote. Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, the former slaves who founded Philadelphia's Mother Bethel Church, put the problem succinctly. If we are lazy and idle, the enemies of freedom pleaded as a cause why we ought not to be free and say we're better in a state of servitude and that giving us our liberty would be an injury to us. So the gaze of a judging white public loomed heavily over the earliest of northern blacks' public considerations of their plight in the new nation. Sympathetic whites, after all, had served as the premium mobile of a spate of revolutionary emancipation still underway as the new century turned. Jones and Allen acknowledged the key role of these gradual abolitionists, calling them instruments in the hands of God for our good. Such expressions of gratitude toward white agents of black deliverance became genre conventions in the tradition of emancipation orations of the ensuing decades. African-American speakers regularly admonished their freed listeners to conduct themselves in ways that would not cause abolitionists to doubt the worthiness of their efforts. As Absalom Jones put it, let us conduct ourselves in a manner, in such a manner as to furnish no cause of regret to the deliverers of our nation for their kindness to us. In addition to offering the gratitude due their patrons, blacks' respectable behavior also promised to help refute the greatest argument against the complete equality of African Americans. Racial discourse in the early 19th century North posited that the problem with slavery was not simply that it had made slaves slave-like and thus justifiably enslavable, but that the residue of slavery carried forward into freedom in the form of licentious and ungodly habit. Many black spokespersons believed that freed people, unschooled in liberty's system of incentives for good behavior, might through their deportment diminish all African Americans, high or low, in the estimation of whites. Such sentiments clearly revealed elitist tendencies. Hammond's heart, for example, was pained to reflect on the, quote, ignorance and stupidity and the great wickedness of his black auditors. Really a remarkable statement. Yet in their fears that free blacks' licentious behavior might strengthen the bands of oppression for those still enslaved, the early leaders also evidenced a deep connection with and concern for the less fortunate. Had it been otherwise, had that connection not been present, no advice, elitist or otherwise, would have been forthcoming. Let's move to the era of colonization. By the turn of the 19th century, with over half of all northern blacks free, the foundations of African-American protest thought had been laid. In the first decade of the 19th century, however, northern black leaders confronted new challenges and opportunities which transformed their understandings of black liberation. I'm sorry, this is the age of the uh, abolition of the slave trade, excuse me. The first step in this process owed to the abolition of the slave trade to America. In March of 1807, President Thomas Jefferson signed into law a bill to abolish the trade of slaves to the United States, thus capping a process uh, permitted by the Constitution and already underway on a state-by-state -state basis throughout the North. Though the abolition of the Slave Trade Act um, conceded much to the interests of slaveholders, 
it nonetheless represented a clear movement toward the fulfillment of universal liberty. The orations that black leaders composed to accompany annual celebrations of the anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade to America deepened the spiritual underpinnings of black protest thought as black spokespersons sought to place current events in a framework of sacred history. They retained earlier concerns with black comportment while they enhanced their valorization of white abolitionists who had made this important step towards liberty possible. In public speeches throughout the northern states, African-American spokespersons lauded the efforts of the white abolitionists, John Woolman, Anthony Benezé, William Wilberforce, Granville Sharp, and others who had advocated so ardently on behalf of black freedom. In the slave trade orations, we see the rudiments of African-American sacred history, the first concerted attempts to identify Africans with the enslaved Israelites of the Old Testament. Absalom Jones of Philadelphia delivered the clearest statement to this effect in a sermon from 1808, in which he argued that in causing the slave trade to be abolished, God had once again interposed on behalf of the oppressed and distressed to deliver them. The ultimate agent of liberation envisioned by black leaders was God, who in his unfathomable, unfathomable condescension and incalculable benignity had infused in influential white men the desire to aid Africans. But as you can see, attending these orations was an unmistakable air of deference, a rhetorical diminishing of African-American agency. God had acted not through blacks, but whites, whose hearts God had disposed to act for liberty. Abolitionists were instruments of divine goodness. Their efforts were as the paternal hand rearing its tender offspring to mature years. And African Americans carefully tempered their gratitude for new reforms with the old assurances of black docility. Absalom Jones called not for complete abolition, but for slaves and moral education. He prayed not for a Moses, but a Joseph, who might save blacks, quote, not from earthly bondage, but from the more galling yoke of sin. Deference was also evident in the persistence of black leaders' calls for freed African Americans to exhibit respectable comportment. As Henry Sipkins put it in 1809, blacks' upright and steady deportment would merit from whites more favors like the freedoms blacks had already been given. Such statements, which sound so compromised to modern ears, were not as simple as they might sound, for they also furthered the strategy pioneered by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones to arrest prejudice and wrest rights from an intransigent America. According to Joseph Sidney, blacks' dignified and proper conduct promised to put to silence critics of black emancipation, quote, and must eventually convert our enemies into friends, unquote. Public advocacy of respectable deportment offered assurances to whites, but perhaps more importantly, they also posed freedom to blacks as tentative, the favorable outcome of a conflict still underway, and one requiring African Americans' discipline and unity. These early orations, though they did embody important concessions, established motifs for later generations' massive efforts to use public speech to alter a prejudiced public mind on matters of race in America. Respectable deportment promised to, quote, melt callous hearts and render sinewless the arms of sore oppression. And I was thinking this, mo this, this uh, metaphor of melting callous hearts remind me uh, of uh, Celeste's talk yesterday in melting the chains of slavery onto colonization. Nothing operated to ripen this strategy of public persuasion more than the emergence of the African colonization movement. Since the late 18th century, a few prominent African Americans, notably Paul Cuffey, supported abolitionist efforts to establish colonies on Western African soil, but most American blacks rejected the idea, particularly as espoused by the American Colonization Society, or ACS. Founded in 1817 by prominent white reformers and statesmen, the ACS offered a Janus face solution to America's race problem. To blacks, it offered release from an increasingly hostile racial climate. To whites, the society proposed a way to let go the wolf's ears of slavery in a manner consistent with revolutionary principle, yet not too subversive of slaveholder interest. The society's plan for gradual compensated emancipation for the purpose of removing blacks voluntarily to Africa would satisfy all parties. Of course, it didn't. Though the society achieved the early support of a wide range of influential Americans, Though it succeeded in transplanting several thousand African Americans to Liberia, it failed in the long run to appease its two crucial antagonistic constituencies, that is, of course, southern slaveholders and northern free blacks. <clears throat> 
Northern free people of color often found the society's rhetoric specious and its benevolence hollow. Regardless of individual blacks' ultimate stance on colonization, however, the movement's significance for the development of black protest more generally cannot be underestimated. The rhetoric of colonization supplied black protest with critical ideas and tropes, which African Americans appropriated and refashioned for their own uses. The centerpiece of the colonization society's appeal to African Americans was a dual promise. Through African colonization, blacks could build a nation that would protect all African descended people from the vicissitudes of Atlantic civilization. And at the same time, they could redeem blacks' ancestral homeland by evangelizing its heathen peoples. Colonizationists argued that a black African nation founded on anti-slavery principles would help stay the slave trade and promote the general emancipation of all slaves in America. Furthermore, the missionary impulse behind colonization would spread the light of Christianity to those Africans who, as one colonizationist put it, were plunged in all the degradation of idolatry, superstition, and ignorance. Colonization energized strains of nationalism that had long been brewing among free black spokesmen. For years, northern black leaders had spoken of Africa as our nation, had inserted the label African into the names of their churches and community institutions, and had argued for the consanguinity of all people of African descent. As New York's William Hamilton put it in 1827, all black people were united under a common banner. Quote, it makes no kind of difference whether the man is born in Africa, Asia, Europe, or America, so long as he is progenized from African parents. This is a notion that's very easy for us to understand today, but we have to remember that in the antebellum period, in the early uh, period of the early republic, this notion that all people of African descent were one political entity had to be built. For those embracing it, African colonization offered the chance for blacks to realize for themselves the opportunity at nation-making denied them during the American Revolution. In 1817, when society representative Robert Finley first approached Philadelphia black leader James Fortin with the colonization plan, city blacks rejected it. Fortin, though, had warmed to the idea, convinced that colonization would permit his people, quote, to become a great nation. He worried that black Americans, quote, will never become a people until they come out from amongst the white people. Even more important for blacks' sense of collective solidarity than the promise of a black nation in Africa were the consequences of opposition to colonization. Colonization arguments quite unintentionally fostered the antebellum era's great tradition of independent black protest, lending it its central motif of American national redemption. The colonization society argued that racial prejudice was intractable, a position which did itself reinforce racism by foreclosing the very possibility of eradicating prejudice. To Samuel Cornish, a fierce opponent of colonization, the society's logic that prejudice could never be expunged was akin to, quote, deifying prejudice and paying homage at the shrine of one of the grossest sins that ever disgraced the human family, unquote. Furthermore, by arguing that blacks should be re repatriated to Africa, that they naturally belong there, the society raised suspicions of black, about blacks' national identities. Were blacks even properly Americans? Or were they aliens in a foreign country bereft of the benefits of national protection? Countering such claims led blacks away from embracing Africa as a national homeland, but toward group solidarity in America. Blacks' claims on the country fostered a potent sense of nationalism, American nationalism. Time and again, African Americans asserted their fundamental Americanness, always in response to claims that their inherent nature somehow unfitted them for the promise of liberty and the rights of citizenship. Additionally, black leaders asserted that prejudice was not ineradicable, that it might be possible to alter the public mind. Prejudice had to be conquerable, of course, or the arguments of the colonization society would win the day. Convention of uh, Black New Yorkers told the colonizationists in 1831, quote, we are content to abide where we are. We do not believe that things will always continue the same, unquote. A great number of later antebellum black activists agreed that they waged battle in the malleable world of ideas rather than the intractable realm of national military conflict, which nearly everyone understood was impossible. As the Black National Convention of 1847 put it, we struggle against opinions. Our warfare lies in the field of thought, 
And thus, black leaders returned with renewed vigor to the problem of representation first identified by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones in 1794. Since they couldn't leave America, how could African Americans themselves help to change the American public mind? What could blacks themselves do to stem the tide of prejudice? And the answer lay in undermining a key premise of the colonizationists, that blacks could not rise in America. According to the American Colonization Society, the African in this country belongs by birth to the very lowest station in society, and from that station he can never rise, be his talents, his enterprise, his virtues, what they may. Northern blacks sought to refute this claim by literally embodying the virtues that colonizationists claimed they could not. Through their own actions, behavior, and comportment, African Americans could rebut racist claims of their inherent inferiority, demonstrate their elevatability, and thus roll back the tide of prejudice. I think, wrote Austin Stewart later on, that our conduct as colored men will have a great bearing on the question that now agitates this land. Let it be shown that we as a people are religious, industrious, sober, honest, and intelligent, and my word for it, the accursed system of slavery will fall, as did Satan from heaven. For African American leaders, the great value of moral reform lay precisely in its applicability to every single African American, regardless of status or condition. Each one for himself must commence the improvement of his condition, wrote Samuel Cornish. It is not in the mass, but in individual effort and character that we are to move onward to a higher elevation. As a class, African Americans might not control much, but they could always control themselves. God, wrote the Reverend J.W. Lewis, holds man responsible only for his moral conduct and the formation of his moral character, and on nothing more in his own existence has he control. In foregrounding their own characters as the primary means of securing their complete liberty, African Americans fully developed themselves as primary agents in the quest for their own redemption. Colonization had unwittingly thrown black leaders back on their own devices. By the 1820s, colonization had become the primary focus for anti-slavery reform. It swallowed whole the withering revolutionary era movement for gradual abolition. Northern blacks, who had enjoyed the minimal but significant patronage of white anti-slavers, found themselves bereft of important allies and advocates. As Henry Highland Garnett put it so sagely in 1843, since blacks were nationally friendless, expatriation was not an option. As he said, the pharaohs are on both sides of the blood-red waters. In the 1820s, as nearly all northern blacks became free, as whites increasingly fantasized about the dangers posed by the free people in their midst, blacks found themselves friendless. This alienation provided a powerful spark to a new generation of leaders and institutions. Black people throughout the North united against the threat posed by colonization. In New York, the first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, initially took an ardent stand against the movement. In Philadelphia, James Fortin listened to his people, recanted his stand on colonization, and began compiling the minutes of black meetings protesting the scheme. As the basis of thoughts on African colonization, which Garrison published in 1831, his work helped inspire William Lloyd Garrison to embrace immediatism. In Boston, David Walker published an incendiary pamphlet that denounced colonization as a plan to separate the enslaved from the free blacks who alone could best champion their cause. And starting in 1830, African Americans began meeting in state, regional, and most importantly, national conventions to reject colonization and formulate plans for independent action. These efforts reflected the simple realities of race life in the 1820s. Blacks could look to none but themselves for help. Even when a new band of white radicals enrolled in their defense in the early 1830s, black activists never forgot the lessons of the 1820s. They chafed under white patronage, altered the direction of white abolitionism, and charted entirely independent routes to freedom. The late 1820s heralded the maturation of a tradition of independent black protest that fueled resistance to slavery and prejudice through the Civil War and beyond. This tradition relied upon a final vital motif that the colonization movement also unwittingly supplied to black activists. This is my last point before concluding. Colonizationists appealed to blacks by offering, offering them a chance to bring civilization and, and Christianity to benighted Africa. With some good intent, uh, some sympathetic colonizationists offered potential emigres a vision of a noble African past and an explanation for Africans' current suffering. Typical of such statements was an article from the colonizationist African Repository. Africa, it wrote, as the birthplace and cradle of civilization was soon to be restored to its previous heights through the work of its sons in America. 
these black people in America, redeemed and renovated, improved and perfected by their exposure to Christianity in America, would return the light of civilization and of heaven to the depressed continent. Um, sometimes this doctrine is called the doctrine of the fortunate fall, that um, God always brings good out of evil, and so the good made out of the slave trade was the Christianization of Africans in America so that they could return. Some African Americans, Paul Cuffey, Lot Carey, Daniel Coker, John Brown Rustworm, embraced elements of this vision of black national redemption. A free man of color from Charleston, South Carolina, resolved to immigrate so that he might, quote, infuse into the natives notions of pure morality and erect temples dedicated to the worship of Jehovah. Many more African Americans, uh, though, adopted the motif of African redemption only to turn it back upon the nation that had forsaken them. It was not Africa that first required redemption from sin, blacks argued, but America. Since the days of the revolution, African Americans had asserted that no nation founded on the principle of universal liberty could consistently deny blacks freedom and equality. And they repeated this point at every opportunity. Fourth of, uh, Fourth of July or Independence Day celebrations were particularly good uh, opportunities. Peter Williams of New York uh, said at one of these events, uh, remarked on America's racial double, double standard. The freedom we have attained is defective, he declared in an 1830 address. Whites could rejoice in their deliverance from a foreign yoke, he declared. Blacks must mourn that a yoke a thousandfold more grievous is fastened upon them. And Williams' use of that word mourn, of course, recalls Frederick Douglass's uh, 1854 uh, unbelievable uh, Independence Day address um, uh, that he delivers in Rochester. Sort of the highest statement of that theme. Black activist transformation of the American Colonization Society's trope of African redemption transformed African Americans' understandings of their own agency. Black spokespersons embraced the newfound mission of, Afri of American redemption with millennial zeal. If whites proved unwilling or unable to liberate blacks, blacks themselves would become instruments in the hands of God. As J.W. Lejeune put it, divine instrumentalities for divine, divine ends. And if blacks were good enough to liberate Africa, they were good enough to redeem America. Rather than leave for Africa, the colored American declared in 1837, we will stay and seek the purification of the whole lump. Declared the black-led American Moral Reform Society in 1837, our object is to extend the principles of universal peace and goodwill to all mankind. This is truly a global vision. Such sentiments, which became commonplace in the 1830s, were a far, far cry from the utterances of early national leaders. In 1809, Joseph Sidney could deliver an address celebrating the anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade the year before, in which he prayed God for white abolitionists' further intercession on behalf of blacks, that some Wilberforce, some champion of African freedom, would arise to plead blacks' cause in the slave states. By 1843, the movement had produced a Henry Highland Garnet, who, like the earlier Jupiter Hammond, also believed that slaves were duty-bound to reverence and obey God's commandment. Where they differed was this. Garnet foreswore the earlier generation's reliance on the Pauline dictate to obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, and instead suggested that God commanded the oppressed to seek their own freedom. Garnet turned the tables on the repressive theology masters sought to instill in the enslaved. Now, by heeding the words of revolutionary radicals that rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, or Lord Byron's assertion from Child Herod that they who would be free themselves must strike the blow, the oppressed had an obligation to resist, openly and actively. For Garnett, the commandment to obey meant that the enslaved had a solemn duty to throw off their oppressor, oppressors using, quote, every means, both moral, intellectual, and physical, that promises success. Now, Garnett's call for militants ran afoul of more moderate voices in the black convention movement, but the fundamental logic uh, of that address differed little from that set forth by the far more conservative American Moral Reform Society in 1837. True Christians, according to the, to the society, had a duty to their maker to employ their own capacity for liberation. The society declared, we are thrown into a revolution where the contest is not for landed territory, but for freedom. We are morally bound by all the relative ties we owe to the author of our being to enter the arena and boldly contend for victory. Let me finish up here. 
the revolution in black agency affected in the 1820s and 1830s transformed the role of respectability among African Americans. Uh, many scholars have wondered at the pervasiveness in antebellum black protest thought of concerns uh, of these uh, black leaders' concerns with the behavior and comportment of working class African Americans. How, these scholars ask, could black leaders have retained faith in such a conservative philosophy, especially in the face of evidence that rather than mollifying racist whites, blacks' elevation merely inflamed their envy, suspicion, and hatred? And this is largely true in the uh, Philadelphia riots of 34 and the New York riots with sites of black uplift and elevation, like the Colored Orphan Asylum, uh, which was attacked during the draft riots of 1863 in New York that attracted the mob. And this ultimately is the question that Professor Mellish raises in Disowning Slavery when she suggests that African Americans had little choice but to accept the burden of proving that they were worthy of equality and respect. Um, but other scholars have mentioned this too. Emma Jones Lapsansky in her work on Philadelphia, um, George Levesque, Frankie Hutton's work on the antebellum newspaper press, R.J. Young, they've all wondered, well, how, how can this be rational? This conservative philosophy of moral uplift just seemed to get whites angrier. So how could it have been functional? It's true that the strategy of respectability was not without its paradoxes and limitations. But by staying sensitive to changes in how African Americans themselves understood their task, it's possible to understand it as, a more, as more than mere dysfunction. The black leaders' invocations of respectability from the Revolution to the Civil War evidenced some consistency. The strategic purpose of respectability changed greatly over that time. From a negative strategy designed to forestall criticism, it became a positive assertion of blacks' agency in effecting racial change and, indeed, worldwide salvation. As early as 1827, Nathaniel Paul could lecture black New Yorkers on the significance of blacks' own behaviors on the world historical stage. Quoting here, our conduct has an important bearing not only on those who are yet in bondage in this country, but its influence is extended to the Isles of India and to every part of the world where the abomination of slavery is known. Though, as we have seen, even the earliest free black leaders stressed the need for African Americans to comport themselves properly, none would have dared to imagine the millennial potentialities envisioned by Paul. Rather than accept the burden of proving their equality, black spokespersons placed the burden on the nation. This, again, repeats a point John made. To demonstrate the substance of its founding mythologies and the consistency of its principles. As the Black National Convention of 1835 put it, if America is to be instrumental through the providence of Almighty God in blessing other portions of the peopled earth, how necessary it is that she should first purify her own dominions. This was no mere rhetoric. From advancing lawsuits through state courts to violently resisting the recapture of fugitive slaves, black actions predicated on these words led the nation to the brink of the abyss. In 1852, Frederick Douglass, who so effectively balanced the millennial spirit of radical abolitionism and the practical concerns of free people of color, announced, it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. Less than a decade later, Douglass got his way in no small measure because free black northerners had placed the question of racial freedom on the national agenda. Their uncompromising rhetoric and actions had fostered the great ideological divides that brought about the Civil War a cataclysm in American society, African Americans transformed into a moment of universal human liberty. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, David W. Blight. He is certainly one of the nation's foremost authorities on the Civil War and its legacy and he is currently a professor of American history at Yale University. However, I am uh, reminded of his 13 years at Amherst College, as I used to be a dean there, and so I'll just remember you at Amherst College, David. Um, Blight's first major book, Frederick Douglass's Civil War, helped to establish his reputation as a preeminent scholar of the period. His Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, which was published in 2001, has earned an unprecedented number of awards and presented a new way of understanding this nation's, that, that war. 
He, is also, he was also a senior Fulbright professor in American studies at the University of Munich in Germany in 1992 to 93. Previous to his university career, he taught for seven years in a public high school in his hometown of Flint, Michigan. David Blythe. Thank you, Beverly. Whenever Flint gets into my introductions, if it's a college campus, some of the students always wish they had Michael Moore, <laughs> which is the only thing anybody knows about Flint. Um, I apologize, or I regret that I couldn't be here Wednesday night and yesterday for this great conference, but yesterday was the last day of class at where I work, even though some of my students blew off yesterday's class. <laughs> On a beautiful spring day in New Haven, I couldn't do it, so here we are. They were, oh, good, good. I told them about it. <laughs> right. Uh, it's also a thrill to be in this building. I have not been here since this was restored and rebuilt. And God, what a space. Um, well, um, I actually read Patrick's paper as a little more about memory than you. <laughs> <laughs> you actually are letting on, but maybe that's just a habit these days. In Avishai Margallet's recent book called The Ethics of Memory, he meditates at length on the question not only why human groups remember collectively, but whether they should at all. His subject is captured in the question he asks, his words, what should humanity remember. His short answer is, I quote him, striking examples of radical evil and crimes of humanity, such as enslavement, deportations of civilian populations, and mass exterminations. This is an answer one might expect from an early 21st century Israeli philosopher struggling to explain a broad human obligation to remember in secular ways what has become the often sacred memory, memory of the horrors of the 20th century. Margallet's conclusion is instructive in understanding the central arguments, I think, of these two papers, or some of the central arguments. The source of the obligation to remember, writes Margallet, comes from the effort of radical evil forces to undermine morality, to undermine morality itself by, among other means, rewriting the past and controlling collective memory. The obligation to remember, he says, is there because it's over against the power of the radical evil to right the past. As African Americans experienced the American Revolution, were inspired by the Enlightenment ideals of revolutionary ideology, petitioned legislatures, courts, and Congress for their freedom and human rights, turned the irony and paradox of slavery and freedom in the model republic back on to the nation they wanted to love but were so unloved by, were gradually, falteringly emancipated in these northern and or New England states, who was writing the story they were living? And what master narrative could they adopt for themselves? Indeed, which country could they actually claim to be living in? Was it one the country rooted in a radical expanding evil like slavery? that may not be redeemable without a further revolution, destruction, and recreation? Or was it, secondly, the country chosen by God to experience his second coming and containing a divinely appointed suffering race whose example would itself somehow be the source of redemption? Or three, were they living in the country with the right values, those four first principles of the Declaration of Independence, that moved the nation in an inevitable course or onto an inevitable course of progress toward redemption, 
if it gradually reformed, allowed its blessed, boundless environment to expand liberty, the country, this third country, where the principles were all right, or the principles were all in place, only their practice had to be improved or perfected. Which of those countries were they living in, in the early republic? That was, of course, an open question. For black abolitionist leaders and writers in the early republic, from Venture Smith to James Fortin to Mariah Stewart and many others, they had to understand whether they were living in a narrative and a trajectory toward liberation and some kind of security, or one toward a permanent slavery and racial prescription. Indeed, just what was permanent about their lives was a central question. In short, could they imagine themselves as part of a memory community with a future, as Douglas once said, with hope in it, or a future with despair in it? Were they marching into Egypt or beyond Jericho? Now, the papers, which I was privileged to read, that both of these authors are beautiful writers, and a lot of ideas going on in both of these papers. Let me take Patrick's first. From Patrick's rich and thoughtful paper, we see a story of ideological, even teleological transformation of the black protest tradition over time. From the divine-centered sense of liberation that would come by God's design and in a kind of, uh, if you like, spiritual or religious time in the writings of, of people like Jupiter Hammond, Prince Hall, Absalom Jones and others, to the more impatient, militant, radical, although often no less sacred claims on America's conscience of people like Henry Island Garnet and Frederick Douglass and many others of their generation. We really are talking about two different generations in this transference of time. Patrick takes up Joanne Mellish's argument that black spokesmen themselves helped to write northern slavery out of the recent past and gently quarrels with it. And Joanne, the measure of an important book is when you get gently quarreled with and may all the quarrels stay gentle. <laughs> Patrick shows that through what he calls a future-looking gaze, African-Americans sought to, in his words, actively insert themselves into their own history. Nice phrase. The old bugbear of agency and just how we define it emerges again in slavery scholarship as it inevitably must. Patrick returns us to what we used to call, or at least what I used, I guess I still call in my lectures, the self-improvement formula, the stress on moral uplift and self-reliance as the way to acceptance in America under what he calls the gaze of the judging white public. Another nice phrase. Good personal conduct would somehow melt white prejudice and lead to some form of genuine liberation. This faith died hard. This combination of faith and a self-improvement strategy along with faith that black folk were living in some kind of sacred history, living out the latter day extension, if you will, of the Israelites of the Old Testament, provided the, the early generation of black thinkers their sense of a history and of a justification. They were, if you like, living in the world and of it, but under God's somehow at least partly discernible plan. Patrick demonstrates quite nicely, I think, how the challenge of colonization in the teens and the 1820s in particular began to change this equation. Uh, the 1820s has always seemed to me a I mean, every decade's a pivotal decade. It's silly for historians to call a decade pivotal. Uh, it's like, it reminds me of a, a question I had in my graduate school orals once where I said something about how the colonies were ripe for the Great Awakening. And one of my professors said, how do you know when something's ripe in history? And I said, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but colonization there in the 20s becomes that 
catalytic force in some ways that, that brings about a kind of new rhetoric and action of refutation. There's an enemy now, and it's called colonization. There's a set of arguments that people are reacting to, strategies they're reacting to. The lesson of the 1820s, Patrick contends, was that blacks came to see that they essentially, and I think I'm quoting this, had no friends, or ultimately had no friends. That lesson forged a new black abolitionism, something Patrick and Jim Stewart and Richard Newman and Julie Winch and Jim and Lois Horton and others in this room, I'm forgetting to put on the list, have all written about so well in, in recent years, that new black abolitionism being forged out of resistance to colonization and other factors included a heightened awareness of the deep and transigent evil of slavery, that it was so deeply rooted in America that it was going to take some kind of new radicalism to get rid of it. It included increased organization and communication and increased militancy of rhetoric and action and a widespread use of print culture, which, which Newman's book is, I think, especially good on. Patrick says that by the 1820s, this can already be called a tradition of independent black protest. Patrick is making, I think, two key assertions, and I find both basically convincing. One is that blacks are using a sacred prophetic tradition to attack slavery and their lot, their temporal lot in America. And by this, I think he means they're using the Exodus story, the Exodus story writ large, the Exodus story as great myth, as great deep story from which a whole tradition of millennial thought would flow. And the second assertion is that they employed irony, sarcasm, satire as weapons against the power of forgetting, rather than in the service only of the erasure of slavery from recent memory. In John Sweet's intriguing paper, we have at least three big things going on sort of all at once. I, and it's impressive. I understand the structure, and it's a wonderful scheme. Now, whether that can all be pulled off in one short paper is, was, of course, his, his self-imposed burden. The three themes are, first, a fascinating reading of Venture Smith's narrative, a close reading of it, which we dearly need, I think. And secondly, the use of Alexis de Tocqueville's ideas on race as an example or a foil of the kind of racism that Venture Smith and other black writers were trying to thwart of what they were up against. And the third theme is the early black writers and orators' critique of America and their attempt to, to create a story uh, that would advance uh, their people. Especially in this third theme, there are all kinds of rich overlaps with Patrick's paper. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just a second. At stake ultimately in John's paper, it seems to me, is who controls the master narrative of early African American history and what indeed was the narrative? He shows us that Venture Smith was one important voice in an emerging public debate, earlier perhaps than most of us ever assume. Venture wanted to be remembered as a man of skill, of integrity, strength, enterprise, honor. He wanted all of these virtues recognized. He wanted to be a great model of an African's self-improvement in America. But he's so often foiled, as, as John tells us, from the narrative by all manner of treachery and, and racism. Now, whether John needs Tocqueville here as, uh, to use as his counterpoise for Venture Smith's quest for a secular respectability is, to me, a question. Tocqueville was indeed trapped in stereotypes and categories and typologies of race, to say the least. Some of his assertions in Democracy in America about the character of blacks and Indians can grate on our ears today almost as much as Thomas Jefferson's lines about these matters in Notes on the State of Virginia. But I wonder if Tocqueville is really the best counterpoise for Venture Smith and the many other black writers to follow him. I wonder if black abolitionists had to worry as much about Tocqueville's views on race, and I don't mean 
just specifically Tocqueville's personal views, but the sort of the typologies he represents. I wonder if they had to worry as much about Tocqueville's views on race as they did now by the 1820s and 1830s, as much as the early virulent pro-slavery writers like Thomas Ardu and many others who are beginning to publish pro-slavery tract after pro-slavery tract. Um, we might want to remember also, and I'm not here to just carry a brief for Alexis de Tocqueville, although I have been reading Democracy in America um, recently with more care than I ever did before. And gosh, I've come to like parts of it. <laughs> um, I, it's worth remembering that, the, that Tocqueville ends that section, that famous section on race, with that, that story, which can be read many ways, of his encounter in the Alabama woods with an Indian woman, a black woman, and a little white child. And, of course, the little white child is dancing about. She's being cared for by the Indian woman who's dressed in some rather apparently exotic sort of Indian-like jewelry and so on. And the black woman in what Tocqueville describes as discarded white people's clothes. And he, and he does describe some characteristics of each of them, but mostly he describes the sort of haughtiness of the little white child. And in the ending of that section, you can sense in Tocqueville his own um, ambivalence about the depth of this problem in America. He's not dismissing it. He sees both promise in this encounter he witnesses and a certain sense of dread. And it's almost as though he, he realizes, in fact, he virtually says that both this Indian and this black woman are in search of a real homeland that this country won't let them have. When John returns to the other early black writers after 1815, uh, his paper becomes even richer. And we see some of the instructive links between these two essays. What a wonderful passage that is from William Hamilton in 1815. I'll just repeat it once. Would that God, would to God, that Columbus with his exploring schemes had perished in Europe Ere he, tr ere he touched the American Isles, then might Africa have been spared the terrible calamity she has suffered. This captures several elements of this agency-driven black historical memory. It captures a certain wish fulfillment. Oh, couldn't the, couldn't the past just be different? Couldn't there have been some turning point when it would have just not happened? We all sometimes experience that. Secondly, the sense of rupture and transformation that is African history become African American history, however understood. A reach for an African historical consciousness, not quite attainable. The centrality of slavery in the development of American history. I may be overreading this quote, but also that ambivalence a sense of living in a marginal space, in a hostile world, albeit one of one's birth. I also found it instructive that both authors end up at great expressions of this African-American ambivalence and assertiveness from Fourth of July speeches. Patrick from Douglas's famous 1852 effort and John from Peter Williams in 1830. And so I can't resist ending myself with Douglas on the 4th of July. It was in those 4th of July orations, as much as anywhere, where black writers could claim, but could also struggle with, which historical narrative they believed they were living in. What future might be possible based on what past? In Douglas's 4th of July oration, which I think is the, which I think Patrick implied as well, which I think is the historical, rhetorical masterpiece of American abolitionism, he drew deeply and transcendentally, I think, on the two great traditions of black abolitionism. One, the Bible, a sacred memory or drama, and the second, of course, the Enlightenment, a secular source of ideas and hope, and therefore a temporal memory or drama. Douglas calls the 4th of July America's national Passover. He knew exactly the kinds of historical memories he was appealing to in his almost entirely white audience that day, 
probably was largely a white audience. The whole speech is as though he demands for an hour that his audience live in a historical drama with him. Calls it a holy day. Calls the Declaration of Independence the ring bolt of the nation's destiny. And many of you I know know this speech um, and probably know it well. But it really has two pivots. It has three parts. It's a classic work of oratory or rhetoric in that sense. And it's classic Douglas. The first, the, third, the first part, of course, is where Douglas starts so softly and smoothly and he honors over and over, honors the founding fathers, honors the Declaration of Independence, honors the founding, um, honors the fact that America is still so young and still so malleable and you could almost sense his audience getting comfortable and kind of feeling good that Frederick came here today to make him feel proud. And of course he says, pardon me, about five pages in, what have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? and so on, and so on. And then he goes to the next page, and the hammer comes down. And it's like a, a hailstorm for the next eight pages of the speech of, in, frankly, some of the most brutal, Jeremiadic language you'll ever read in an abolitionist uh, speech or editorial of any kind. He uses so many adjectives in these eight pages, you can't even count them. And he uses the pronoun you and yours so many times that you, you stop counting them after a while. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. It's the accusative you, 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 you. It goes on throughout that section of the speech. And then, of course, Douglas, he doesn't just use irony, he names it. He says, to invite me here today to engage in your joyous anthems is inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Later on in the speech, he says, what we need is scorching irony. But in one of the most deft moments of the speech, I think we see the two traditions that both of these papers have highlighted and demonstrated were, were the root of this turn, if you want, in black abolitionism around the 1820s. After this kind of sweet secular beginning, if you will. He doesn't even announce his text. But you know, in a, in a, in a well-churched biblical audience, he knew they would know what he was referring to, and he simply floats into the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of, of us a song. And they who wanted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my, hand, let my right hand forget her cunning. And if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. You know, it's Douglas's, it, I, it's, it's Douglas the ironist at his height. It's, he's basically saying to his friends in Rochester, New York, why have you invited me here to sing for you? Now, and he goes on to use the language of blasphemy uh, as though he's trying to say, today I'm going to commit secular blasphemy. I'm going to take the irony of this Declaration of Independence and the irony of slavery, and I'm going to throw it back on your heads, and I'm almost going to bury you in it. But in the last five pages of the speech, the second pivot comes, and he lets them back up just enough. He lets them breathe. He takes the chains off their chairs. He says again, America's malleable and it's young. It's still possible. You can still save yourselves. To thwart the forgetting of slavery, to take charge of their own history and slave America, to forge a usable collective memory. This is what all of these young, these early black American writers were to a great extent trying to do. Douglas and many others argued that this could only be done through and by using all of this wretched sacrilegious irony. Now, whether radical evil could be killed by irony remained to be seen. Thanks. <laughs>
Amazing. Uh, I, uh, in this time of um, question and answer, I would ask um, our two presenters if they'd like to make any comments first before we entertain questions. None, none other than that uh, I appreciate uh, David for his comments, and, and he has a, a real knack for organizing these thoughts in, in, uh, in ways, so thanks very much. Questions? Marilyn. Um, So the, I, I, I share your caution about um, distinguishing between the sacred and the secular commentators. And I, I have to say I, um, I see as much of the prophet in David Walker as in, as in Absalom Jones, if not more. Um, I think the distinction that I prefer to make is, is a temporal one. Um, uh, so it's that Walker and Garnet are coming from a generation that um, that has witnessed freedom and has begun to deal uh, in, a, in a sustained way with the challenges confronting uh, free black communities. Um, but I, I take the gist of your comment to me that the, the concern with respectability um, when it's associated with those you term the religious figures, like Jones and Allen, is in fact more defensive, perhaps, whereas with, are you suggesting that with Walker and Garnet, perhaps, there's a, less of a concern with respectability, or that it's not as defensive? I think that it's actually one of the one of the it's a tension that people refer to frequently and kind of scholars in, invoke and have certainly invoked it for quite some time. Um, I think it's actually one that I'm more concerned with battering down than upholding. Um, I'm, I really believe that there are continuities and commonalities that are far more significant um, than. Um, the, the divergences and uh, the, the we used to talk about um, dichotomies between integration and separation or assimilation and nationalism and and um, I think those might be useful to a point but beyond a certain point they become downright um, obfuscations and they prevent us from uh, understanding the common intellectual heritage upon which um, 
or, or, or that Walker shared with the Philadelphia Reverends. Um, and it's, I, I, I've always just been more interested in trying to understand what that bedrock is. Um, so in what ways, um, I just, I, I love the fact that the American Moral Reform Society in 1837 is saying, essentially, in terms of black agency, almost the same thing that Garnett is saying in 1843. Um, so, and in the same way, those who are considered militant nationalists in the 50s, like Martin Delaney, um, if you look very closely, or even not that closely, they don't really adhere that well to the kinds of this is a, a separatist nationalist. They just don't fit in their cubby holes very well if you look at the trajectory of their careers. So I guess my, my, my quick response would be um, to argue uh, for continuity rather than the distinction. Other questions? Lois? I'm painfully aware that when you read through this, most of the voices that you're getting are, in fact, male voices. Um, um, not exclusively by any means. Um, uh, there's a, M Maria Stewart echoes the, um, the words of uh, J.W. Lewis when she says, uh, I, have, I possess nothing but moral capability. So she's very much a part of, um, a part of these discussions about, about agency. And the, um, but when you talk about limitations and the domestic, um, uh, African American women struggled uh, against gender definitions that often kept them out of public sphere discussions or limited their participation in public sphere discussions. Um, as I say, certainly not exclusively. Um, there is no greater apologist for strategies of uplift and respectability than Marianne Shad. Um, uh, so, and the the idea of antebellum women's proper roles as uh, moral nurturers comported very well with the strategies of moral deportment that black leaders, male and female, pursued. Um, I, I think in many ways, what's always interesting to me about the gendered history of antebellum black protest is that it while, while the kind of traditional narrative of black abolitionism and white abolitionism um, is often deeply intertwined, I think if you gender it, they start disentwining in very important ways. And this is what I mean. It's well documented that the women's movement emerges from white women's anti-slavery. Um, what you don't find is a similar movement among African American women. And I think what you see, and the, the work that I've done suggests, is that um, African American spokesmen and some spokeswomen are so concerned with the fear of not looking gender normative, since, since gender, um, gender defectiveness is one of the charges that is incessantly laid upon blacks, um, that uh, slave families are not real families, that uh, working class families cannot operate like real families, that black women have to work instead of stay at home and be moral nurturers. It puts a premium 
um, in black protest thought on trying to suggest the gender normity of, of uh, black gender identities. And it does that in this kind of middle class way. So what I see in the black protest tradition is a lot of uh, effort to um, suggest to everybody in the public sphere that black women behave the way middle class women are supposed to behave. They stay at home and they're, and they're moral nurturers. And I think it makes it all the more difficult for African American women to break out of those definitions in the way that white women in the abolitionist movement did. So I don't know if that begins to... Oh, I mean, certainly this wouldn't be, this wouldn't be everybody. And, and I mean, but the, I mean, and it's, if you look at Sojourner Truth, um, you know, it's very easy to, to highlight a couple notable exceptions. Um, but if you look at the bulk of it, I mean, women in the movement operated in spheres that were deemed appropriate for women. They, um, uh, anti-slavery fairs, um, um, even when they broke outside of those roles, like Marianne Shad, they didn't do so in ways that, at least I haven't found, sought to revolutionize the notion of what gender, of what black women were supposed to be like. Maybe someone can correct me. That's just what I find. Yeah, uh, I agree with much of what you said, um, but I, I, I find that women are the most active Among black men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just It's, but it's very interesting that the, the, the Jerina Lees are associated with, I mean, I scoured the spiritual narratives looking for um, visions of racial politics that were akin to what we would think of as being the center of the tradition, you know, the, the emancipation to iterations and stuff. And I searched in vain. I wanted to find it. But in Jerina Lee, you do not find her dripping with racial politics. You find a lot of concern about um, there is patriarchy, obviously. They're trying to control the way that she's preaching. And in fact, she's, what's more interesting to me about Sharina Lee, or where I think the lesson is there, is that this is a woman who represents a kind of, it's, it's about class. This is a woman who represents a kind of folk um, uh, preaching style. And that's what gets Daniel Alexander Payne upset, is that here's a woman preaching in a style that's, that's um, you know, basically working class. And, and I, I'm sorry, I just have to disagree, Don. I mean, it's like w- women might be participating, but they're not participating equally because they're not sitting in the conventions. They're just not. And the, the number of, of women who are getting published in the papers is not anywhere near. So while they may be participating in, in, in important, critical ways, doing the kind of the, the, the buttressing work of the movement, fundraising, subscription selling, that kind of stuff. The fact that they're not getting into the record is a critical statement about the way black men understood the appropriate place of uh, black women. Um, Yeah, I'd just like to add a couple things, which is that if you move a little earlier to the time period where I'm more comfortable, um, right around 1800, the early years of the 19th century, um, I think it's true that you don't see a lot of black women writing and publishing um, you see kind of two ways in which black women seem to figure in, uh, if not activism, um, certainly um, in, in um, more reform organizations. One is obviously black women feature very prominently from the 1790s on as the purported um, 
examples of what was the salute about urban black communities. So you get black women attacked as prostitutes, you get black neighborhoods um, attacked um, by riots, um, allegedly targeting their brothels. Um, so black women's um, sexuality and black women's moral comportment becomes very powerfully attacked and persistently um, with riots here in Boston and other places, often associating um, Phyllis Wheatley, um, through the use of the, the term to the name Phyllis, um, with those events. So there is an it's a very explicit attack on the black communities through the sexual um, and gender comportment of, of black women. The other thing you, that I think you see is um, black women in organizing as auxiliaries um, of um, African Union society. So in Newport, there's a female benevolent society that's organized as, er as in very early years of the 19th century that is certainly active, that is certainly in the public sphere. Um, they're working on, um, on poor relief and education. Um, they're school teachers, um, but they're not um, making speeches or leading parades. Yeah. Yes. Rich uh, women in RIT. I was just going to ask how then you sort of bring women into these so called mass narratives of African American history. Um, and in thinking here, so following up on some of David's comments by um, maybe refining the question a bit, if you privilege print as a memory site, do you lose these women's voices? Uh, one example mm -hmm. that I work on right now is Richard Allen. Uh, and, and looking at how he constructs his life, it's pretty striking. That's a good one, Rich. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that I, I think that the way you do that, you obviously must acknowledge women where they are and do the work of recovery that Lois is talking about, and and um, find those voices. Um, if it is in fact the case that women do not figure as prominently in the kind of canonical tradition, um, you have to figure out why that is and and talk about it and. Um, as much as um, we would like to learn, I think, that women were, were key players, the fact that, that they are so absent um, in, the, in the print tradition suggests something that is very much there at work. And it's probably a, a, an absence that is not there in the actual, I mean, it's obviously an, an absence that is not there in the lived lives of people. I mean, if you read Leslie Harris's new book on New York, it's fantastic. And, in, in including um, including issues of gender all ac across black life. So, I mean, obviously, or Elsa Barkley Brown, you can think of that as a model, and the idea of um, um, the community understanding men as political proxies for women's voices, that's a possibility. But um, I don't think, I think that whatever you do, you've got to contend with the, with, if, if it is the case, you have to contend with the fact that um, this is a tradition which is gendering itself largely male, and that's an expression of power in a marginalized tradition, which is a very difficult thing to contend with. Well, one, one thought that occurs to me is that, two thoughts. One, um, specifically on this question of public discourse, um, and it seems to me that it's interesting to see so few women writing because women are so important in abolitionist literature, as, as people have been talking uh, recently. And it actually occurred to me right now that, that one of the big divisions is that women tend to feature prominently in sentimental abolitionist writing um, as um, pitiful subjects, as innocent victims. Um, whereas the writings we've been hearing mostly hear about are, are either Christian or they're Enlightenment in their tone. And in Enlightenment language, uh, men are the political actors 
who are um, mostly affected or you know are discursively constructed as most affected by the de deprivation of political rights by enslavement. Um, so women in some ways I think might be assumed to be um, more dependent and therefore not as victimized by enslavement or by discrimination in the way that black men need to stand up for themselves as men. So I think there's a um, ideological reason why Venture Smith writes as a man um, and not Margaret Smith's wife uh, writing as a woman. Um, and I think that's, there's the second question which is how print shapes other forms of subsequent memory so that if you, go to Stonington, Connecticut, or East Haddam, Connecticut, where he lived. There's currently a big public fight over Venture Smith's home site because Connecticut Yankee, the nuclear power plant, wants to put a waste um, uh, storage area on his former house site, uh, which people hadn't really paid attention to until they tried to put nuclear storage on it, um, or whatever they're doing, maybe it's something else. But um, there's, if you go there, there was, um, there's a lot of public memory in local Connecticut towns about Venture Smith. Um, his wife is not remembered, his children are somewhat remembered by the local families in whose graveyards you know, they, they, the children are buried. Um, but it's really, there's a, there's a, I've been trying to track down public traditions about Venture and the commemoration of him. There's, if you go to East Haddam Post Office, they have the big salt bucket that he carried, one of his feats of strength. Um, there was a Venture's 19th century water company called the Venture Rock Spring Company. Um, so there's a continuous tradition in Connecticut towns of remembering him, but they remember him, I think, largely because his narrative was published, and it was published at key moments of national conflict in 1735 and then um, in late 19th century, um, 1896. Jim? Visions is that women tend to feature prominently in sentimental abolitionist writing um, as um, pitiful subjects, as innocent victims. Um, whereas the writings we've been hearing mostly hear about are, are either Christian or they're Enlightenment in their tone. And in Enlightenment language, um, men are the political actors who are um, mostly affected or you know, are discursively constructed as most affected by the de deprivation of political rights by enslavement. Um, so women, in some ways, I think might be assumed to be um, more dependent and therefore not as victimized by enslavement or by discrimination in the way that black men need to stand up for themselves as men. So I think there's a um, ideological reason why Venture Smith writes as a man um, and not Margaret Smith's wife uh, writing as a woman. Um, and I think that's, there's the second question, which is how print shapes other forms of subsequent memory. So that if you go to Stonington, Connecticut, or East Haddam, Connecticut, where he lived, there's currently a big public fight over Venture Smith's home site because Connecticut Yankee, the nuclear power plant, wants to put a waste um, uh, storage area on his former house site, uh, which people hadn't really paid attention to until they tried to put nuclear storage on it. Um, or whatever they're doing, maybe it's something else. But um, there's, if you go there, there was, um, 
There's a lot of public memory in local Connecticut towns about Venture Smith. Um, his wife is not remembered as children, are somewhat remembered by the local families in whose graveyards you know, the, the, the children are buried. Um, but it's really, there's a, there's a, I've been trying to track down public traditions about Venture and the commemoration of him. There's, if you go to East Haddam Post Office, they have the big salt bucket that he carried, one of his feats of strength. Um, there was a Venture's 19th century water company called the Venture Rock Spring Company. Um, so there's a continuous tradition in Connecticut towns of remembering him, but they remember him, I think, largely because his narrative was published, and it was published at key moments of national conflict in 1735 and then um, late 19th century, um, 1896. Jim? You know, this, is, this is all well and good. So long as we do this research and we recognize the context within which these women have come. Promiscuous, yes. Absolutely, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, as 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 you folks have written about so so eloquently, like the the, the demands of um, redeeming black masculinity. And in many ways took a kind of paramount importance and disciplined those in the community to watch how they express themselves so that they would not appear non-gender normative. Um, and I think that's very powerful. So in that way, I mean, masculinity is clearly trumping femininity and its primacy in black rhetoric and the, the public stuff, anyway. Is Marianne Shad the only black woman who actually edited a newspaper? I'm trying to think. Well, um, actually had an editorial role. Henry Bibbs, well, this is an interesting point. Like, Voice of the Fugitive is edited by Henry Bibb, who was supposed to not be very literate, and his wife was highly literate, so she probably wound up editing mm -hmm. The Voice of the Fugitive. Mm -hmm. Does she get credit? No. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our time has come to a close. That does not mean that we have to close out discussion, and I want to first thank the um, Athenaeum for this lovely space and the Colonial Society for its leadership in um, gathering us all for this important conference. Uh, I must tell you that on my way here, um, on my cell phone, which, by the way, for historians who love to do research, do research on how to silence your phone and it will <laughs> vibrate. If, you don't, if you're not capable of doing that research, your students or children or grandchildren will do it for you. <laughs> Um, that's how I learned how to silence mine. Um, but my father said to me on my way here, um, make us proud. <laughs> um, the connection between 
the history you research so well and write about so eloquently is connected to the lives of all of us today and is particularly connected f for me to the institutions um, that I represent, um, the Museum of Afro-American History most prominently. The agency that we gain is gained through the research you do and how accessible you make yourselves. I am so proud today that as I look about this room, there are so many historians who, who go beyond the normal bounds of academia to reach out to m my institution and help us preserve and interpret and further collect this um, incredible history that is so important to our understanding and the future viability of this country. Um, I am about to attend a conference that Jim Horton and I are co-chairing for the National Trust for Historic Preservation on the future of African American historic places in this country. Um, I am going to see a colleague there who will remain unnamed, um, who is white, who, who is the head of a historic site that I have found that I am related to. My daddy told me. <laughs> um, there's no way else I would know. Um, but my daddy certainly knows all about his family because his family is my family. We share a great grandmother uh, in common. So I, I, I want to say, I haven't told him yet. Um, <laughs> uh, because part of what I want you to understand is I've been crying about this for some time. This knowledge is so upsetting. This memory that I must now deal with, just so insane to me. Um, even though I have uh, endeavored to know all this history, we live this history and must understand it not only in our professional lives, but our, in our personal lives. And I vowed that this weekend, um, maybe I'll have Jim and Lois holding my hands, uh, that I will tell him um, so that he can begin to deal with what I think he already knows. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're right. Old is in. Um, I, I, I encourage you, um, uh, as you leave this conference, to record the fact that you have been here um, beyond the, um, the incredible information you have gained um, the uh, camaraderie of your colleagues, uh, the beauty of at least yesterday. Um, uh, it is important as a record, and I would uh, determine, especially for the women here, to record this in, in uh, your diaries, in email, um, in snail mail, and tell your colleagues and your families about the power uh, and the historic occasion for gathering together to discuss New England slavery and the slave trade. Thank you very, very much.